portion of Beshalach, that after we were sent out of Egypt, the question is, what route did we take? Did we take a direct route to Sinai, which was ultimately, that was the objective of the Gula, of the redemption, we should become the Amashim through the receiving of the Torah. If that was the case, we should have gone directly to Sinai. Yet the Torah tells us that Hashem took us a circuitous route. God did not lead us according along the Philistine highway, because it was close. Because Elohim had said, the people, when they will see the war, they will want to return to Egypt. Over here, the Sephardim explains, Although the godly intention was to take them to Sinai, the Kabbalah Torah, Will be shown there to Israel from there go directly to Eretz Israel. Ko'amru v'lokati eschem li lo'om ve'visi eschem el ha'oretz. If I take you as my people, I will take you to the land. Ko mokam ha'kavona ato hoysel licham liyam suf. But now the intent, intention was to take him to the yam suf. Ash lo hoyo derech la'echod me'ele v'ze la'atbiim shom es par v'chelo. The purpose, the objective of leaving. Now was to take the Yamsus to drown them. They should drown, he and his army should drown. Al Derech, as if Omishachti Lechel Nachel Kidron and Sisro, Kishon that God had drawn drawn Sisro to the to be drowned. Be it had Derech Hayoshva Kotzer, Lolechus Mitzram the Yamsuf, Hoya Derech Eretz Plishna. But factually, the most direct route to the Yamsuf was the Philistine Highway. Because it's close. So now the objective is not Sinai, although the ultimate objective is Sinai right now is to destroy Paro Vechelo and his armies. And the, the most direct route is the Philistine highway, except because it's closest to Egypt and they could have a change of heart while they'll be confronted with war. Therefore, he's taking the circuitous route through the desert. Okay? So over here, Rashi says Chazal, the Medrash, what does it mean when they will see war, they will want to return? As we found, we were attacked by Amolek. If they would have gone a direct route, the most direct route, they would return. Here we find, even when he took him to circus route, Amru Nitna Rosh, let's appoint a leader, let's return to Egypt. If he would take him on the direct route, Allah has come for Kama, there wouldn't be a question. So we hear. The Sipsech HaChomim explains that when we were, at, we were far from Mitzrayim, they said, let us point the leader and return. So why don't they point the leader? So he explains, Klomar, Bishul Chesorin, Rosh, Heimenim Chosim, because they couldn't find a leader to lead them back. Kem Chaderach, Rochu, Shichim, the Rosh, there they need a leader to take them back. Avol, Shoy Yilem, Rosh, Pshito, Shoy Chosim, Api show you Rechokim, Meretz Yisrael. But if they would have had a leader, even though they were at a distance from Egypt, they would have gone back. So what would be if they would be close? They don't need a leader to bring them back. Because everybody's familiar with the area. Koshim shu krovim b'derch pshuto, shei tshichim l'rosh ho yechosim, they would have returned. Now, they said, let us appoint a leader and go back. Why didn't they go back then? Of course, when they started to complain right away, God punished them. God flexed, so-called, flexed his muscle and told him he's not gonna to tolerate this behavior. So 
if that's the case, even if we would have gotten a short route, if God wants us at Sinai, he will punish them if they want to go back. As he punished them later, he'll punish them now. So what difference does it make if it's a circuitous route, a direct route, it's all the same. So what is the difference? When they said later, let us go back, appoint a leader, which Rashi over the sites meetings of idolatry, that's post-Sinai. Once God took us to be <coughs> his people, gave, gave us the Sinai, there's no going back. He's not letting us go. This is pre-Sinai. Pre-Sinai, you're not there yet. If you're not there yet, you want to go back, God will not force you not to go back. He'll let you go back. But if you go back, it's a problem. That means you're not coming to Sinai. You forfeited your worthiness to go to Sinai. Going to Sinai, God doesn't want to set a, 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 put you in a position that you should want to go back. Because if you want to go back, that is a basis that you forfeit your right to go to Sinai. So therefore, God has not put you in a position to force you to go to Sinai. But post-Sinai, where you already became his people and you committed to the Torah, then God is not letting you go any longer. Therefore, whatever is necessary to a guarantee that you continue, he's going to do. What's bringing a plague, bringing an enemy upon you, whatever it may be. That's the way I understand it. He took us the circus route through the desert to the Yamsuf. The Chamushim all b'nei Yisrael mitzrayim. Chamushim. What's the meaning of Chamushim? We went up pre prepared. The question: What is pre prepared? Does it mean with weaponry? As Rashi explains, according to one interpretation, Clay Zion, because we find they had weapons when they fought certain battles. Of course, they were they prepared for the eventual. Or does it mean a fifth of the Jews left Egypt? And four fifths died. Only a fifth of the Jews left Egypt. Now, and so when did the four fifths die? They died during the days of darkness. Now, why did they die? So Rashi, during the plague of darkness, explains because they had no interest in leaving Egypt. Meaning they did not have the Amuna and the Betochon, the faith and the belief to go into a desert to trust God. It was only a fifth who had that special level of trust in Hashem. HaKadosh Baruch says, God says, Zuchati loch chesed nuraich, Avas kul saich lech lech achai b'mid b'beres lozua. That was only that fifth. The other fifth did not have that, that belief that to go in an uncharted, unplanted desert, how are they going to survive? As we say, of course God can God could do anything. God's the creator. After seeing the revealed miracles, there's nothing beyond God's will or God's capability. The question is, will he? He said he will, but maybe he won't. That was the four-fifths. That's why they perished. They were willing to go out of Egypt. The fifth had that belief and the trust. Therefore, they followed God into this unplanted desert. Okay? So the fifth was speaking about uh, not necessarily the cream of the crop, Dustin Lavrian went out of Egypt. They were evil. In terms of what they were evil, they may have been other evil people, but in terms of trusting God, they trusted Hashem that He will deliver. Until now, Dustin Lavrian only displayed their evil in regard to the relationship with Moshe. They never showed their, in terms of relationship with, with God Himself. Later we find Adas Korach. They were the main instigators. They were the usurpers of Moshe, but again, it was Moshe. But they went directly, although they were at Sinai and they witnessed that Hashem was God's spokesman, they went against him. So therefore, they went against Hashem. The mon, where God says it wasn't going to fall on Shabbos, they planted the mon out in the field to show it was there. So again, what are you trying to do? So there, that evil manifested itself and even Beinot and Lamoko. But at this point, the evil had to do with their relationship with Moshe Rabbeinu. So the fifth that went out, in terms of their personal behavior, outside of their faith, there's no indication where they were at. 
this fifth. Because we see when they came to certain points later at the Yamsuf, there was a group of people, as the Ramban says, they complained how Mibnei Kavar Mitzrayim. Are there a lack of graves in Egypt? Meaning to go into a desert, we have faith God will deliver. But now we're stuck between the sea and the Egyptian army. What happened? That degree of faith they didn't have. And they complained. Are there a lack of graves in Egypt? Did you take some de desert to die? So Ramban over there explains that was only one segment because this seems to be a little bit of a contradiction. They, it says they, they cried out to Hashem, they prayed, and yet they're complaining, I mean, do they have the belief? Don't they have the belief? So Ramban says there were different groups. Many of them, or most of them did believe, and they prayed, but there was a certain segment of this fifth that didn't believe. Meaning, although you have faith at one level, at another level you don't have that level of faith. Therefore, they complained, Hamibli, are there a lack of graves? That's the Ramban. Rashi learns, explains, they first prayed because Tafsu, Um the Savosim, they took hold of the craft of their forefathers, which is Tfilah. And when they see, saw it didn't happen, that's when they began complaining. So they, it's the vast majority complained because it's another level of, of faith that one needs. How do, you, how, you, how do you go through a sea? Can't go through a sea? Now, the Ramban writes that the Jews believed. Now, the, what did they believe? They believed this was the Gula. But when they saw the Egyptians pursuing them, they had a question. If God truly wants to redeem us, for us, see the two, the two parts of the equation. Did he bring the, the plagues on Egypt punish the Egyptians because they were bad people. And that's why we were released. But are we, do we have any personal worthiness? We have no worthiness. So if that's the case, we're not gonna survive the desert. If that's the case, if we're confronted with the sea, the sea's not splitting. Why are the Egyptians pursuing us? If God valued us for us, why is he allowing the Egyptians to pursue us? Evidently, it's not us. Whatever he did to the Egyptians was to punish the Egyptians. It's not that we're special. So if that's the case, they began complaining. This is how, this is how the Ramban explains. You know, it's interesting. You know, when a person is in a certain predicament, our minds play, play games on us. And we start coming up with all scenarios and all uh, approaches why things are happening the way they're happening. And we try to find fault immediately. Rather than find fault with ourselves, we try to point the accusing finger at someone else. Moshe, it's you, it's God, it's what, it's when. That's what it is. Because again, they, they, if a person has faith, faith means there is no question. If there is a question, now we have to look for an answer. What's the answer? It could be many answers. And most of the answers probably aren't even correct. Because it's based on faith. You can't second, second guess God himself. And that's what happened. To have the question, why? Oh, why did you put us in this predicament? You know, you've already failed. Because if you have faith, you have trust, there is no question. If you don't have trust, then you ask the question, are there a lack of graves? Why did you bring us here? And that's where the Jews were holding at this point. This is Sephardo we find that when Moshe had communicated the four expressions of redemption to close, the Torah says, Lo shomu lo Moshe, kosher. They did not listen to Moshe, they weren't receptive to what he said, because they were short-winded and the overwhelming hard work, because they had to meet quotas. The fact is Moshe proved through miracles that he was the redeemer. He said the code word, Poko Jivkot, they knew he was the demon. So factually, all pieces fit and fall into place. So why don't you listen? The, the two things, there's abstract believing and internalizing the belief. The Jews didn't have the ability to what? To really, to internalize what actually was happening. What's the reason? You know, sometimes a person says, you know, it makes sense. 
So why did you accept it? Because it makes sense. What about, despite the fact it makes sense, the complications and the difficulties? If the basis is it makes sense, what happens to now it doesn't make sense? So we're, we're pitting not making sense to making sense. It makes sense. You perform miracles. We're expecting you to come down the pike, so to say. It makes sense that you, you are the redeemer motion. But what's happening? Things are becoming more complicated. Paro's withdrawing the source straw subsidy. And they're still demanding the same coat of bricks. What's happening? Doesn't make sense. As much as it makes sense, but, but what are we basing everything upon? Because intellectually, it makes sense. But what about if you're confronted? So then we have a problem. According to our understanding, now it does make sense. So something in the equation is not fitting, it's not working. Moshe, Moshe, because you wrote Babo Kosha. Because if fully made sense, and you have no, this is not a contradiction, because you truly believe he's the redeemer, it's not a problem. There's no question. Why is there a question? Because I had the answer. But if I don't have the answer now, I have the question. Once you have the question, you have a problem. So the Sifar over there says, and that's why in the desert, when the Miraglim came back with the ominous reports, and there's a question who to believe, the 10 or the two, they believed the 10. Because they, they already displayed their approach. What was the approach? Their approach was not faith. The approach was, it makes sense. So when it stops making sense, then we have a question. There's a Midrash, the Midrash says that when Hashem said to Moshe, Bosli Bigdosh Shachati Besocham, so he chose Pitzalel to oversee the building of the Mishkan. Immediately, there were murmurings about Moshe. His brother's the Kohen Godel, he's the high priest, his nephews are the assistant, high priests, and now he appoints his nephew to oversee the building of the Mishkan. So there were murmurings. So the Torah says that God had filled him with wisdom, with divine understanding. So Moshe says to them, do you see who B'tzal is? He has a capacity, none of you have the capacity. They said, oh, now we understand. So what silenced the murmurings? It's like a person has to work on a project and you need a 600 IQ to work on this project. And the average person has 110 IQ. They understand, I'll give you a problem to solve. They, do, they can't even read the problem. And this other person's already solving the problem. So, oh, now we understand why he's qualified and we're not qualified. When they saw who Betzal was, they said, you know, now it makes sense because you've explained it to us. So what was the basis for accepting? Not that they had trusted Moshe. That Moshe was the spokesman of God. It makes sense why he's more qualified than we are. So if the approach always is, it makes sense and we understand and it all has to meet the criteria of you understanding, then we have a problem. Because whenever you don't understand, then we have a problem. Because then you question. So what is the ultimate level of achievement? You have no question. And if you have no question, because you have trust, then everything falls into place. Because if you allow the question to gnaw at you, you have to have an answer. And if you have no answer, what happens? Either you come up with the answer, which is not the correct answer, or you, or you revolt. And that's, what, that's the history of what continuously repeats itself with Klal Yisrael in the desert. The Torah tells us, Vayikach Moshe atzmos Yosef imo. Moshe took the remains of Yosef with him. Why? Ki ashbi ashbi es b'nei Yisrael. Because he had a jury the Bnei Yisrael, Leim Apokot Yifkot, Elokim Eschem, God will remember you. Valisim Esatz Mosim Yizayitchem, you should bring up my remains with you. So over here, the Mosef Rashi cites the Midrash, but it's a Gemara. The Gemara says, why did Moshe take the remains and no one else took the remains? You have 600,000 men above the age of 20. You have men less than 20 years old. Millions of people going out of Egypt. Everybody's aware that there's a prerequisite. You cannot leave Egypt unless the remains of Yosef are taken out. Because that was the agreement. And they swore. 
They borrowed all the gold, the silver. As it says, everyone had minimally 10 pack animals filled, laden with the gold and silver. But you realize, unless you meet this criteria, you, you, you're remaining in Egypt. So don't you understand, you know, you have a vault, but you don't have the combination open the vault. What's the value of the vault? And it's an impregnable vault. You can't leave Egypt unless you take the remains of Yosef. So why was Moshe the only Jew who attended to this, to this need? to meet this criteria, this prerequisite. So the Gemara quotes a posuk, Mishlei, Chacham Levi Kach Mitzvos. The person with the wise heart takes mitzvos. And who's Chacham Levi Kach Mitzvos? Who has the wisdom of heart? Zem Moshe Rabbeinu. Because what was everybody else doing? Borrowing the silver, the gold, the garments, whatever they were. But what was Moshe doing? He was locating the remains, because that was the prerequisite, the precondition leaving Egypt. Why was Moshe the only one? So the Pesach says, because Shlomo says, because he had chacham leiv, he had chokhmah salev, he had wisdom in the heart. Nobody had his level of wisdom of the heart. Because he had that special wisdom, now you have two people, very bright, but there's intelligence, IQ, and there's wisdom. Wisdom something else. Who is a wise man? Ezel chokham haroas anolat. It doesn't say the wise man is Venus of Nolat. He understands the eventuality, the ramifications of the decision. He sees the result of his decision. What is the result of doing or not doing? What's seeing? Seeing is reality. The Chochom, the person who has wisdom, it's not just, it's not abstract. It's not I figured it out, I understand where we're gonna end where it's gonna end up. I, I'm, I'm at the finish line already. When I'm at the finish line, am I gonna finish or are we not gonna finish? The one who sees the nolad of not taking out the remains of Yosef, he's looking for the remains of Yosef. Not meaning, not that means 200 years was in vain. There's no Jewish people, there's no Kabbalah Satora, Torah, there's nothing. God's glory is over. That's the way Moshe Rabbeinu saw it. It's not he understood it. Everybody else said, with millions of people leave, leave, leaving Egypt, it's inconceivable of all those people, nobody should attend to the remains of Yosef. Impossible. Inconceivable. Impossible. By Moshe Rabbein, it was nothing impossible. Nothing inconceivable. Why? Because he had Chacham Leif. Now, what was that Chacham Leif? What was that? Why did he have that special one? Aaron HaKohen. Aaron was the special he was chosen to be the Kohen Godel. He was, to a degree, almost equivalent to Moshe Rabbeinu. But what was the difference between Moshe and Aaron? Moshe did not have a trace of self. Everybody has, at some level, a certain conflict of interest. We all have conflict of interest. As they say in the vernacular, every man has his price. Every person has his price. And when God tests us, a test is always based on what we could deal with. Because if a test is beyond our, our, our capacity, it's not a test. A person is, is destined to fail, it's not a test. But so that means everybody, every person has his price. If a person is tempted beyond his capacity, he's gonna fail due to the temptation. What about if that person doesn't have, there is no person, there's no trace of self. Every aspect of his being is purely God's glory. And nothing exists in his life other than that. What's his capacity? 100% capacity. There's nothing could deter him from that reality. He cannot be in any way swayed or deterred. He has absolute clarity. Because there's no self-conflict always creates, blurs the reality to a degree. There's nothing to blur anything here. Because what blurs things is the conflict of interest. If there's no self now, trace of self, there's no conflict of interest. Now, you have a choice. Wealth, which is power, which you could give Kiddush Hashem, turn it into that, and you have finding the remains of Yosef. Hashem says, Go out with great wealth, but you have to go out. What happens if you, 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 you don't meet the criteria to go out? What's it all worth? There's no Achkech. Moshe Rabbeinu understood there may not be that. So Moshe, who has no interest at any level, not even the Shem Shemayim, 
Shem Shemayim is they should be a Jewish people. That's what God wants. They should be a Sinai. That means we have to leave Egypt. What does that mean? We have to take out the remains of Yosef. Everybody else says, it's inconceivable with such numbers. Nobody should attend to that responsibility because everybody has that conflict at some level. It may be microscopic or less than that. Sub-microscopic, doesn't make a difference, but there is a basis that is a conflict. Once there's a conflict, there's lacking the Chachma slave. Moshe was the Chacham Leiv, Yikach Mitzvah. Therefore, he took this Mitzvah and he was the only one who was qualified to have that level of clarity for that reason. The Torah makes it a point. Why is it a point for us to know Moshe took the Atzmos Yosef? Does it really make a difference? Who took it? The Torah is telling us. Why did he take it? Because he is that special person. He has the he has the Chochmah Salev. He has the wisdom of the heart to be able to do it. That's why he took it. That's number one. We'd mentioned in the past when Yosef had a journey his brothers. He says, Halisa Mesatzmos Mize Itchem. So Rechaim HaKodesh makes a point over here. Zeg, miraculously, is 12. When Yosef was looking for his brothers in Shechem, and then Gavriel, the archangel, said to him, they went to Doson, he said to them, Nosu mi They traveled from Zeh. He could have said, Nosu, they traveled. So Rashi over there says, what did they do? Nosu min They have no interest in, in brotherhood with you. The brotherhood is broken. There's no 12. Yosef would only forgive his brothers only if they reinstate that 12. Now how do you prove that we're united and unified? Yosef had his own children. Every one of the tribes, the children took their remains out. Why did Yosef want that Kalal Yusuf should take his remains out? Ephraim Menashe could take his remains out. He had descendants like everyone had descendants. It's not enough. Because they have to show, they have to re, reunify the number. They broke the unit, it has to be re, re, reconstructed. Therefore, Klal Yisrael has this responsibility. Without it, his children taking out his remains is not enough. So the Sifardo says, it says, Vayikach Moshe. Who is Moshe? Moshe is the Nosi. Moshe represents every one of the tribes. So when he took it, it was the equivalent of the reinstatement of the twelve. That's the reason why it says Moshe took the remains. But that's not according to Chazal. According to Chazal, it's Chacham Levi Kach Mitzvos. It's the point that who Moshe was. According to simple understanding, without the Gemara, without Chazal, it was Moshe represented Klal Yisrael, therefore he qualified to be the one to reinstate the number 12, to reunify Klal Yisrael, to be one entity. Torah tells us we were fleeing and Hashem says to Moshe, tell the Bnei Yisrael they should travel in the opposite direction. Here they're traveling away from Egypt, that they should travel towards the enemy. Why? To create an impression that the Jews are confused, they're actually locked into the desert. And before who should they travel? Who is Piachiros? So Rashi says initially this was Balzaphon. Balzaphon was one of the deities of Egypt. And the reason why it's called Piachiros is because they became free. The Jews became free. <coughs> and what does it appear as if that the deity of Egypt has actually has locked them into the desert? We're still under the control of the Egyptians because Piachiros, Balzaphon, is the deity of Egypt. And therefore, we're locked in. So Rashi cites Chazal. Who nisha mikol This is the only, Hashem destroyed all the deities of Egypt. To show he is the Almighty. So we have a question. So why did he destroy Balzaphon? Kedesh latosan shem koshi rosan. This is to mislead them, the Egyptians, that to believe that this deity 
is could stand up to God. All of Pirish Eov and Eov says regarding this incident with Balsafon, Mashki Lagoyim Yabding. So what is the meaning of that? Mashki Magdil Hagoyim Atzlicham. God puts the Goyim, the nations, on the pedestal, gives them success that they believe it's forever. Valibam is Goya Bibhatzlochosum, and their hearts become totally swollen due to their success. Abdon, and that's the beginning of the end. That's the basis for the destruction. The people after the world, they believe they're, they become invincible and they could make no mistake. And only that sense of confidence and assurance, self-assurance, that's the basis for the downfall. They're careless and they, and they have, same thing here. Baal we're going after the Jews. We're going after them. We have nothing to worry about. Why? We have our deity. Now, there's an obvious question which we'll discuss in a moment. There's, we discuss in the Agora, the Yamsuf, how many miracles took place at the Red Sea. It was the most spectacular event, splitting of the sea. Was it 50? Was it 200? Was it 250 miracles? We're talking about something not to be, to be understood. What the maidservant saw to see, Yecheskel Novi as great as he was to not see what the main servant saw. So here, the Egyptians are pursuing the Jews. All of a sudden, the sea splits. Water is flowing thousands of feet in the air vertically, besides the other miracles that take place within the sea. And the Egyptians don't even stop for a moment to be startled and amazed to reflect on what they just saw. They pursue them straight into the sea. Doesn't make any sense. Don't you? You should be frightened for a moment. Say, well, God hardened their hearts. Doesn't make a difference. Are they jumping into a fire? They're not going to a fire. This is like going into a fire. You go into a cave and you don't know if you're coming out of the cave. Where do they have that confidence that they, they don't have to be startled, they don't have to be amazed? And as they go in, they're coming out. Why do they pursue him? Because this deity, Hashem allowed it to remain. Why did God destroy this power? This power is with us. We'd have to be concerned about it. It's true, God split the sea. Therefore what? But we have Balsaphon. We have our deity and God can't destroy him. If he can't destroy him, we have nothing to worry about. But little did they know that God himself didn't destroy Balsaphon to draw them into the sea. That they should be destroyed in the sea. That's exactly. They believe we have nothing to be concerned because God didn't destroy our. Of course God split the sea. God split it. But therefore what? God brought the 10 miracle, plagues on Egypt also. <coughs> so this is 250 times what happened in Egypt. We, didn't, we don't doubt God can't do those things. But we have an ace in the hole. We have bouts of foam. And proof of the pudding, God couldn't destroy him. Therefore, we have nothing to worry about. Therefore, there's nothing to be startled. There's plenty to be amazed. But that's not our focus. Our focus is to get the Jews, get our wealth back, and destroy them. That's our focus right now. And how do we know we're guaranteed? Because Baal Zephon. So God elevates you, puts you in a position of confidence and security, ultimately, to destroy you at that moment. Now, it's interesting. There's a midrash. The Balaturim cites it, but the Medrash Chuma says a little bit more. When Paro was told that the Jews had crossed the three-day trek and they're not coming back, immediately he summons his cavalry, galvanizes them. They're going after the Jews, and the Torah tells us. Uparo Hikriv. Now, Rashi cites Chazal, the Medrash. It should say Paro Korav. Paro, by Che, he got closer. What's Hikriv? Hikriv grammatically means he brought himself closer. So Rashi cites Chazal. Hoyel Lichto Paro Korav. Mao Hikriv. It's reflexive. Hikriv Atzmo. Nisamets Lakadim He brought himself closer 
and he empowered himself to go before his people. Normally, a king travels behind the lines. He traveled at the beginning to lead them into battle. Moshe's theme line, as that was originally said. That's the simple understanding. He grief. The Balaturim says he grief. He grief is carbono. He brought a sacrifice. What did he bring a sacrifice? Kevon Shebo Lefnei Baal Tzavon Hikriv Korban Lo. Baal Tzavon was his deity. So people, they bring sacrifices to their deities. So Paro Hikriv, when he saw Baal Tzavon was in power, and even God couldn't destroy him, according to his understanding, Hikriv, he sacrificed. He sacrificed a korban. <coughs> okay? What, what exactly was this about? So over here, as I mentioned, Hant Chuma, Das Akedah Balitosis cites this. doesn't say it's the Mensch Hant Chuma. Oparu Hikriv, Hikri is a poor honest lobo olof. He brought the tragedy to bring upon himself. He could have Yisrael the Tshuva, that's one. Kevo Chiro Yisrael, Sheshov Yisrael Achareim. When he saw them retreating and traveling in the wrong direction, V'chonu l'fnei pi achiros l'fnei baltsefon. When he saw the Jews camping before the deity, Oma paro baltsefon, hiskim agzei rosi. The baltsefon has agreed with my decree, la'abdom b'mayim to destroy them through water. Originally he said, all male children, then should be drowned. That was the decree. When they believed, when they, he was told then that the Redeemer of Israel drowned, he withdrew it. But he said, what was his original intent? To kill the Jews through water. So he says, now I see about, so where are the Jews going? They're going to the sea. They can't, what's the sea's there? So that what's their choice? Right into the sea, they're gonna drown. So I see now about Tzvon, Hiskim out say Roslav the Mamayim. But I have to make sure that it happens. Hiskil is Abech, the Kater, or the Nasik Laborazoro. Then we started to, to bring the sacrifice, to slaughter it, and sacrifice it, and pour libations to this deity. It's a Hikr of Karbon. So what's the Hikr of Karbon? that the Jews should actually drown in the sea, which was his original decree. Now, let's understand. When originally he says, we're gonna outwit the God of Israel, what did they say? Of course, God of Israel said, but we know whenever he punches anybody who misbehaves, it's always measure for measure. So if we drown, the, if we kill the Jews with the sword, he'll kill us with the sword. If we kill them by fire, he'll kill us by fire. But if we drown them in water, that he can't act measure for measure because he made a common with existence. He will never bring a flood upon the world, which will destroy the world. Since Egypt is the height of civilization, if we're destroyed for all intents and purposes, humanity comes to an end. Therefore, we're gonna drown them. We're gonna drown the male children. That's how we're gonna outwit him. So what does Hashem say? true I will not bring water upon you but I'm you going to the water now how do we you going to the water they're gonna borrow your gold and silver vessels they're gonna deceive you you're gonna become enraged you're gonna pursue them into the sea okay but why did he choose why did he choose to destroy them because he saw through his astrology because he was an expert astrologer that Moshe and Shel Yisrael is need them the mind that the Redeemer of Israel will be judged by water his end will come as a result of water and he was unaware that it was the main Mariva. That it was because Moshe Rabbeinu struck the rock in the 40th year. He was on, he thought he's gonna be drowned. Now he says, Xay Rossi was the Jew should be drowned. Now, God left that mark in the zodiac. Though Jews have to drown, be drowned by water. Right? 
the Jews are going to the sea. If the sea doesn't split, they're going straight into the water, they're going to drown. So he started to bring sacrifices to his deity to assure that it actually comes to fruition. Because the stars say they're going to drown. But why did the stars say something which is not true? Moshin Shel Yisrael, that's the Moshin Shel Yisrael. That is the Redeemer. Ultimately, it's going to be So he still believes it's going to be water. But factually, why does it, evidently it says in the stars that they're going to drown through water? Now, we read in this week's parsha where they went through the sea split and they go through the sea. So we read in the, we see in the, in the parsha it says, The water was a wall to the right and left. They passed through walls of water. The walls, the water flowed vertically, no longer horizontally. Now the word choma is spelled deleted. The vav is deleted. So without vows, how do you read it? The wrath of God was to the right and left of them. What does that mean? So Chazal said, the Medjah says, the Malochim, they came to God and they say, why are you destroying the Egyptians in the sea? The Jews deserve to be destroyed in the sea. Elo of the Avodazor, Elo of the Avodazor. So therefore there was Chema. Now, according to that prosecution, what should the stars say? The Jews are coming, having their end. So what does Paro see in the stars? The Jews are going to be destroyed through water. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. He doesn't know how yet. Are they going into the sea? Is the sea going to close on them? But they're going to be destroyed through water. So what does Hashem do? Hashem goes and answers the Malochim, removes the prosecution. What's that? That's called the Malam and Ateba. The Zodiac only forecasts nature. Something that's a miracle. The Zodiac doesn't, 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 it's not within the context of the Zodiac. So therefore, Hashem allowed the sign in the Zodiac B, it's there. But Derech HaTeva, on a natural level, Zodiac says, the Jews will be killed by water. And they're going right into the water. And God leaves the Balsafon, because the only one who could bring this about is only this deity. And God cannot destroy this deity. Therefore, he brings, starts bringing Karbonos, sacrifices to this deity to assure and guarantee that they should be destroyed through water. This was the whole idea. So again, it's Mashki Goyim La'abdom. God elevates the Goyim ultimately to bring about the downfall. You know, we usually say, person, how did he become a real estate mogul? Because the person before him, he bought and succeeded to a degree, and the person started to believe in his own narrative that he was such a genius. There's no way for him to make a mistake. And ultimately, because of his arrogance, he missed something which even an ordinary person would have noticed. But because of his arrogance, it, it actually passed over it. And that was the basis of his downfall. So when this other person comes, he comes, picks up the pieces. Picks up the pieces. And what happens when he becomes, has that level of success, the scenario repeats itself. Everybody believes his own narrative. There's no way I didn't arrive here by making mistakes. I don't make mistakes. People, I don't seek out counsel up to, to a point. I know better, okay? So what happens tomorrow? He has his downfall. Mashke Goyim, he elevates Goyim, the nations, to a point where they believe in their own narrative, they're invincible. It's forever, but it's only to topple them when they have that level of assurance that he pushes them off the cliff and every, everything comes to an end. The Roman Empire at one time, they believed they were here forever. They lasted 500 years, then everything just fell apart, just collapsed. They, it was like so rotten, you know, you have a, a cedar and the tree, and it's majestic, but you don't realize it's all eaten out on the inside. The slight wind comes, just topples it over. Of course, the meat of the tree, the life of the tree is no longer there. Same thing, but if you look at it, you think this is here forever. There's no way enough, this could even be pushed over. The slightest wind could push it over. When the Jews saw that the Egyptians were coming after them, 
It says, Vayitzik Huel Hashem. They began praying, and the measure says, why? Tafsu Umnos Avusayim. They took hold of the craft of their forefathers. Avram prayed, Yitzhak prayed, Yaakov prayed. Omer, Altiri Tolas Yaakov. Don't be fearful, Tolas Yaakov, the worm of Jacob. It's a post in Yeshaya. Loma Nimshul Yisrael Tolas. Why are the Jews compared to a Tolas, to a worm? Loma Loch. Ma Tolas Hazo. The worm. In a Makas Arosmel Bafio. How does it topple a cedar with its mouth? The Rako, Marcus Akosha, the worm is it's soft. It's malleable. You touch a worm. But with its mouth, it's able, when it starts eating away at this hard wooden entity, it topples it. We find that the nations of the world are analogous to cedars. Shenema Hine Ashu Erez Balvono. The Syrians are the cedar in Lebanon, cedars of Lebanon. God will smash the cedars of Lebanon. When the nations overpower us, the Jews do tshuva, we repent. We cry out and we pray. So again, why the Jews compared to the worm? Because the worm, although it's soft and it's malleable, it gnaws away at the cedar, which is hard, and it topples the cedar. And what's that with its mouth? Its mouth has that ability, and therefore it topples it. You know, we find in terms of the uh, dietary laws, the Torah says, mentioned it, and then it mentions the laws which pertain to a human being. A woman who conceives gives birth to a male to a female says all the all the laws which protect her. The laws of a woman who's given birth, her days of spiritual purity, when she's contaminated, when she has to bring a korban, a sacrifice. But the previous parsha speaks about the kosher species, not kosher species. So it says, why does it say the laws of the animals before the laws of the human being? The laws of the animal, what chooses its cud, what doesn't, so all, all the various species. Fins, scales, fish, all this. So it says that if the person himself is haughty, we say to him, you know, something, Yitush Kodmach, the flea was created before you. So don't think, if you think you're so special, you should be created first. But you know, God created the flea even before you. That's the humble person. Now, so my question is, Dovim El says until him, I'm a worm, I'm not a man. I mean, if you want to speak about something that's measly and small, you should say, I'm a flea, I'm not a man. A flea is less than a worm. So why does David say, I am a, I am a worm and not, and not a man? He's displaying his humility it says there were three most humble people in existence. Moshe, Avram, and David. Moshe says, not no more. What, am, what are we? Nothing. What did Avram say? Anochi of Vefer. Ash and dust, it's something, although it, there's no life in it. David says, I need tole evoluish. I'm a worm, I'm not a man. A tole, as much as, as measly it is, as it is, it, it's, it's, it's a living entity. David should have said, and the Yitush. Now, the power of the Jew is in what? In his mouth. He's a worm, just as the worm topples the cedar. It eats away with its mouth, which is tefillah. Now, what is tefillah? Tefillah is an expression of humility. There's no such thing as kochi dozi yodi. There's no such thing as it's the power and the success of my ability. It's my, the, my power lies in my tefillah. Feel means it's you, Hashem, it's not me. So when he says, I need to label the wish, it's not saying he's nothing. Whatever I am, 
Dovin Melch Shor Chai Bekayim, but why? Because Hashem, it's you, it's not me. That's the reason. That's why David said Tilim. He's the author of Tilim. He's the one who said the Shir Sishbachos, because he appreciated who Hashem is more than anybody else. Therefore, he wrote the Psalms for that reason. He gave all the song and the praise to Hashem for that reason. Of course, and that's why his tefillah was so special. The language we use to, to be mispalel, to supplicate Hashem, is tilling. It's his words. That's, um, so that's a display of his humility. I'm a worm. A f- what's a flea? Flea means it's nothing. It doesn't make, make a difference. It has no function other than it bites a person, or it's a parasite, whatever it is, the flea. This is not a parasite. This is something it gnaws away at that cedar. Its power is in its mouth. Well, whose power is in its mouth? That's us. This is the Koko Yaakov. And that's the reason why that's the Toleya. And that's the power of the Jew. Immediately, what did we resort to? When we saw we had, it was a helpless situation. But Yitzhaku El Hashem. Tafsu Umnos Avosim Biodom. Immediately, they took the craft of their forefathers. And when it didn't happen, that's when they started to complain.